In this video, we're going to take a look at finding a maximum directional derivative or gradient for a function of two variables. The function we're looking at is f of x, y uh, equals cosine of 3x plus 2y. And we'll look at the specific point when x is pi over 6 and y is negative pi over 8. All right, so the first thing we want to do is get some partial derivatives. And let's make sure we have enough room. So we'll find the partial derivative of f with respect to x. So x is our variable of differentiation, y is treated as a constant. Derivative of the cosine function is negative sine. And then the chain rule would take the derivative of the argument there, the 3x plus 2y. A derivative of 3x plus 2y with respect to x is 3. And so we get negative 3 times the sine of 3x plus 2y. All right, now let's do the partial derivative of f with respect to y. The derivative of the outer function works the same way. Derivative of cosine is still negative sine. But when we take the chain rule derivative of 3x plus 2y, we're now thinking of y as the variable and x is a constant, and so the derivative of that would be 2. So these come out a little different. At that point, we're ready to write out the gradient. You can see that uh, upside down triangle symbol being used here, the abla f. Um, you might also see it just written as rad f. Um, and it is a vector, so you might see the vector notation for it. And what we do is we take the partial derivatives and make those the components of the vector. So uh, for a function of two variables, this is just a uh, two component or two dimensional vector. And we can write it in the ij notation using the unit basis vectors. In that case, we'll have the negative three part with i and the negative two part with j. Um, you could also just write it in component form, depending on the situation. Want to know each. So there's the component form. All right, we may want to evaluate the gradient at a point. Uh, we were looking at this point here when x is pi over 6 and y is negative pi over 8. So we'll replace x with pi over 6, replace y with pi over 8. Um, and this will give us a vector again, but it'll be a constant vector opposed to a vector value function like the gradient itself. All right, so 3x is going to be 3 times pi over 6, um, which is pi over 2. And then 2 times y is 2 times negative pi over 8, uh, which is minus pi over 4. And, you know, that argument ends up repeating. Um, so we get the same thing here. 
Uh, and pi over two minus pi over four is just pi over four. So uh, we get negative three sine pi over four i minus two sine pi over four j. Um, sine of pi over four is one over square root of two. And so we end up with negative three over root two i minus two over root two j. Or again, in component form, it would look like that if you wanted. All right, so this gradient is a vector. And like all vectors, that means it has a magnitude and a direction. Um, so in steps four and five, we look at the magnitude and direction separately to analyze the gradient. Uh, Conceptually, the gradient represents the maximum directional derivative. So its magnitude is the maximum rate of change as you kind of add a point on the surface um, or on the function uh, surface here because it's a function of two variables. Um, and you're kind of looking at the different paths you can go. Um, you find the gradient is the direction where the derivative would be maximized. Um, and so we'll find the direction in step five, with the unit vector. Um, and then we'll find the actual rate of change in that direction with step four, which is the magnitude. So we're just finding magnitude and direction from this vector, um, stuff we've done before. For the magnitude, we do the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. put the negative three over root two in there squared and the negative two over root two in there squared. Um, and so the denominators will be two and the numerators will be nine and four. Uh, so we'll get 13 over two, square root of 13 over two. All right. Um, for the direction, we want the unit vector in the same direction as the gradient. To make any vector into a unit vector in the same direction, just divide that vector by its magnitude. So you can see why we did it in this order. Um, we'll use the magnitude from step four, um, and we'll divide by that, um, dividing the gradient vector from step three. Uh, and then we'll just use u hat for this unit vector. So uh, how do we want to do this? We are just going to divide each component. So let's go ahead and write the components that. And then we're going to divide by this square root of 13 over two. So of course, dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. And so what we're actually gonna do is multiply by the reciprocal. Uh, and so the reciprocal would be um, square root of two over 13. And then the square root of twos cancel, right? Because the we'll divide to one, uh, leaving us with 
our unit vector negative three over 13 i minus two over 13 j. Oh, that's the square root of 13, sorry. So if it was a little sloppy, I probably should have distributed the square root um, there, right? Square root of two over square root of 13, right? Because that's square root of 13 over square root of two. And less likely to get rid of that square root when we cancel those square root of twos. All right. Um, so th this tells you the direction of the gradient, but sometimes, you know, when I look at that vector, I don't really know what direction. It is. So I could graph it and technology could show me, but to get a better sense of it, uh, I might want the angle and standard position that corresponds to that vector. Um, and so that's what we do in step six to round this out. Um, I mean, I could tell that it's in quadrant three because these two components are negative. Um, so I know it's between pi and three pi over two or 180 and 270 degrees. Um, but yeah, but I'd like to get kind of an accurate angle measure um, to know the bearing of this direction. Now, we know that the unit vector should match up according to this formula so that that first component is the cosine of the angle and the second component is the sine of the angle. Um, so you can use inverse cosine on the first component or inverse sine on the second um, or a little of both to kind of help with uh, validating. Um, remember, it's going to be tricky with any of these inverse trig functions using a calculator. You'll get one of two values usually. Um, and so you've got to decide, is it that the correct one or do we need to adjust it? Um, and we'll see that happen here. So uh, again, noticing that the first component is cosine theta. I'm just going to equate those and solve for theta. Uh, and so if cosine of theta is negative 3 over root 13, then theta is the inverse cosine of negative 3 over root 13. Right? And that's not a unit circle value, so that's where we would use a calculator. Now, if I plug this into my calculator um, and I'm in degree mode, um, it gives me about 146 Point three one degrees. So there are rules for adjusting these, but you got to know when to adjust it, and then you got to know the rules. So personally, I always draw a picture for this. I can't remember it any other way. Um, let's set up a quick sketch of the rectangular coordinate system. and then uh, draw the angle in standard position. So uh, again, I, I know that this is in quadrant three, right? Um, since both of the components are negative. So I'm gonna draw uh, an angle in quadrant three. I don't know. Selected the weird disappearing pen here. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even know that was an option. Uh, I guess there is a time and place for that. Now is not time and place, right? Oh. Um, all right, so that's my theta. Uh, and then I look at the value there and I think, okay, did the calculator give me the right value? And I would say no, right? Because it should be between 180 and 270 degrees. Um, since I'm using cosine, 
right? I know that it did use the correct X value. Um, and so what it actually gave me this angle, the angle in quadrant two um, and that is the 146.31. So then I use the symmetry of the situation and realize that this is also 146.31, but of course in the negative direction. Um, and then I realize that I need to subtract the angle that the calculator gave me from 360 to get the correct value. Um, and so you'd be subtracting from 2 pi if you're using uh, radians. And so that should be 213.7 degrees. Um, so you have different rules depending on sine, cosine, and tangent when you use these inverse functions. I mean, that's another option is you can do the inverse tangent of the y component over the x component, but you'll still have to deal with this sometimes. So hopefully that was something you saw in trig and remember is tricky. Um, just draw the picture and uh, you should be able to sort it out. So we've got everything we want to know about this thing um, and it's time to validate. Um, one thing we didn't do is just find a general directional derivative for an angle theta. Um, and what we'll do is we'll find the general directional derivative for an angle theta, and then we'll think of it as a function of the angle theta. And then we'll use calc one to optimize that and find the maximum value of that function. Um, and uh, the angle and the maximum value should match up with the results from steps four five. And then we could put it back in and get the result from step three. So let's move on to that validation. So the notation for the directional derivative uh, in the direction of some vector u is, I think, d subscript u f. So f is your function of several variables. u is the direction. Um, I'm not sure why it doesn't have like a vector thing. Maybe it should um, be like that or something. Um, and it's going to look kind of like the gradient where we got the partial derivatives. Um, But we also have the cosine of the angle times the x partial and the sine of the angle times the y partial. So this is cool. It kind of validates our partial derivatives uh, from steps uh, one and two, or one, two, and three. All right, so let's now put in the uh, values of the partial derivative at our point, right? Remember, this was negative 3 over root 2 and negative 2 over root 2. So we use those values here. But we leave theta as a arbitrary angle so that this is a function of theta. Okay.
And then we want to find the maximum value of this function and the theta value that goes with it. Um, so you can just graph it, um, but it's not that hard to use calculus to figure this out. Uh, remember, optimization with calculus, you take the derivative, set it equal to zero, it's solved. So we'll be taking the derivative with respect to theta. So d by d theta of the directional derivative of f. Um, and so we take the derivative of that first part, first term, and the derivative of cosine is negative sine. There's already a negative there, and so we just get positive 3 over square root of 2 sine theta. And then with the second term, the derivative of sine is cosine, so it stays negative. It goes to negative 2 over root 2 cosine theta. Right. And so then we set that equal to zero, and we want to try to solve this for theta. Uh, one way of doing that is to divide everything by cosine. And cosine over cosine is going to be one, zero over cosine is going to be zero, and then sine over cosine is going to be tangent. Um, and so you end up with 3 over square root of 2 tangent theta minus 2 over square root of 2 equals 0. Adding the 2 over root 2 to the other side, you just get that. Oops. Um, and then multiplying both sides by the reciprocal We'd multiply by root two over three. And get tangent of theta equals two thirds. At that point, we know that theta is the inverse tangent of two thirds, and we're back to using our calculator. Um, inverse tangent, two thirds, and again, there's going to be two solutions here. This gives me the quadrant one solution, which is about thirty three. 0.7 degrees. Um, there's also a quadrant three solution um, where we would add 180 to this. And that would give us our 213.7 degrees. So that validates the result from step six. Now, if you put that angle in uh, this directional derivative, um, so evaluate this at theta equals 213.7 degrees, um, putting it in here should give you the maximum value of the directional derivative from step four. which was square root of 13 over square root of 2. Okay. So that's sort of an analytic validation. I wanted to show uh, technology-based validation. And we're going to turn to Python for that. Um, in lab four, we've got a example using the gradient. And so I'm going to copy this and put it in my sandbox. And then just run it, make sure it works. So it'll plot the surface, and then it'll draw that gradient vector. 
Um, what we want to do is so that x and y are defined here, but here we need to define the function of several variables. Um, you can see from the code below that is going to be some symbolic you know, calculations of the partial derivative. So we want to use SymPy for special functions, specifically sim.cos for cosine 3x plus 2y. Um, and then this will find the x partial and y partial. Um, and then it'll display the gradient there. Um, then we want to evaluate the gradient at a certain point. And so here we're using um, pi. So pi over 6 and pi over a, which was negative. And then it'll display the gradient at the point. Um, this code here will create a vector that has the right length. Um, and then we go to a graph. You want to make sure that you, this goes from negative 10 to 10 in both directions. You want to make sure that the point in question is included. I feel like that's a little big of a window. Um, so pi over 6 um, is about a half, right? Um, so close to zero, um, but I think negative five to five might be better. And then negative pi over eight is also pretty close to zero. So just zooming in a little bit. To graph the surface, we use the same function as before, um, cosine of three X plus two Y, but here we want to use NumPy because we're going to use numerical points to get the graph. Um, so NP, that goes, and then we had use the capital X and Y we created with the mesh grid there. So three times capital X plus two times capital Y. Um, and then the rest should just create the graph. Oh, here's the vector for the gradient. So you want to use the point. Um, so it starts at pi over six and negative pi over eight. And then you need the, the value of the function there. I don't think we ever actually did that. Um, what is the value of the function at this point? Um, so go into the calculator and I guess I need to be in radian mode. That's how it's gonna graph this, right? Switch to radian mode. Uh, cosine of, uh, well, it was just 3x plus 2y. Remember, that ended up just being pi over 4. Right? When we put in 3 times pi over 6 minus plus 2 times negative pi over 8, that was pi over 2 minus pi over 4, which was pi over 4. So uh, the z value should just be cosine of pi over 4, um, which is 1 over square root of two. Um, so they, this is kind of the starting point for your vector. And then that's the ending point, right? It's using the, the links there. Or no, I guess these are the, the com that's the starting point. And then these are the, the links in the three directions, at least I hope. And then it looks like we might be making the arrow scaled a little bit because it might just be too big. All right, so it did not like something we did. It didn't like. That. So maybe we are using NumPy here. All right, so we get the gradient displayed here in a general function. 
we get the gradient at the point here, we'd have to, you know, approximate our exact values before. Um, and then there's the function, and you can see it's it is pretty steep there. Um, I think maybe we do want to zoom in a little more. So where was that right here? Negative one to one, maybe. Yeah, much better. So we can see the gradient vector kind of shooting up, uh, which makes sense because we're on the surface here where, um, so this vector is supposed to go in the direction of the steepest ascent. You think of this as kind of like a mountain, right? Um, that is kind of pointed up towards the top of the mountain. All right, um, so that'll do it for maximum directional derivative in the gradient. Um, see you in the next video where we're looking at uh, finding extreme values.